And again, as you join, we got a couple of things we would like for you to do that you can see here on the slide before we get started. And in addition to the co-ops, we are so excited to have our EPPs with us this morning. Love seeing the different colleges and universities we have represented. I always just bring mine so I can do some stuff on the side. Look at you, Rachel, connected to United We Learn this morning. <laughs> Donuts. I got one under our roof. Oh, thanks. And Crystal, I still see some people being admitted. Looks like it might have slowed down. Do you think we should go ahead and get started? Perfect. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we want to welcome you to the training for the Instructional Resources Consumer Guide for Mathematics. We recognize that student access to high quality instructional resources is critical in providing equitable grade level instruction that Kentucky students deserve. Um, we've noticed that schools and districts across Kentucky have been working to define their local vision for the student experience, including portrait of a learner and project-based learning and other things important in their local context. And we're, um, we're proud to present this Instructional Resources Consumer Guide to really support them in selecting the high-quality instructional resources for mathematics that will really help support that local vision and help bring it to life. Our goal today is to provide you with a deep dive into the consumer guide so that you can be equipped to support those within your work to utilize it to be smart consumers. Um, some of you on the call today represent cooperatives, and we hope that you will leave ready to support schools and districts in navigating the guide to review and select a good fit, high quality instructional resource for mathematics. Um, many of you represent higher education institutions, and you work with teacher prep programs and instructional leadership programs, and we believe that knowledge of this tool is important for instructional leaders and teachers alike to be able to recognize HQIRs in mathematics and understand the power and in, in intentionality in selecting an HQIR to support a powerful math program that will ensure all students have access to rigorous grade level instruction. And so we are so appreciative that you are here today and look forward Forward to sharing this information with you. I'd like to introduce our KDE team that has been working on the Instructional Resources Consumer Guide for Mathematics, many of whom are on the call today um, to help guide you through the guide itself. Um, Mickey Ray is our Chief Academic Officer, and she has been sort of overseeing the broader work of our high quality instructional resources. Um, my name is Crystal Rowland. I'm the Director of the Division of Program Standards, and I've worked very closely with our pilots that have been uh, field testing this resource. Um, as well as in the development of the resource itself. 
We have Thomas Klaus with us today, who is an education academic okay. program manager in the Division of Learning <gasps> Standards. And he is also running our show today. So if you have any technical issues, uh, feel free to drop that in the chat or direct message Thomas and he will help you out. Um, we have Misty Higgins and Fox DeMoise, who are professional learning coordinators in the Office of Teaching and Learning, and they have made the heavy lift on our side uh, to get the Instructional Resources Consumer Guide um, in great shape, and so they'll be doing the majority of the presenting from the KDE team today. We also have Chris Patton, who is our High Quality Instructional Resource Coordinator. So if you ever have any questions about HQIR in Kentucky, she's a great contact and a great person to reach out to. And I'm going to kick it over to our team from Ed Reports to introduce themselves and get started with our um, meeting for today. Thank you, Crystal. I'm Stephanie Barnett, and I am the specialist on the partnership side of EdReports, and I've been working alongside KDE team over the last several months as we have put together the consumer guide that I'm very excited to share with you all today. Also on our call today is um, my supervisor, Jessica Faith Carter. She is the senior specialist on our side as well, and she has done the previous work on the, the reading and writing consumer guide, so we're excited to have her on the call as well. So today's objective is to prepare the regional cooperative staff and the EPPs on the use of the consumer guide for mathematics. So you'll be prepared to support districts, pre-service teachers and leaders throughout the state. We want you to understand the consumer guide and all of the embedded tools and resources. So you and those that you work with will be prepared to utilize high quality instructional resources. We will spend most of our time today providing an in-depth overview of what is in the Consumer Guide while walking you through a couple of tools that you can share with those that you may support. By the end of the day, you will end up with a deck that you will be able to customize as well as some training materials that you will be able to use out in the field when you're partnering with districts and working with pre-service teachers and leaders on the importance of high quality instructional resources. So the purpose of the Consumer Guide is to really serve as a resource for districts across the state as they evaluate and select high quality instructional resources. The Kentucky Department of Education has spent a lot of time through piloting and through researching to develop this Consumer Guide, and it is set to be a very useful tool that can be used across the state with consistency. I want to walk you through the context of how we really got to this point. This has been a project that has been in the uh, working for several months, along with the KDE team, Ed Reports, and leading educators. And we have completed a series of training and planning sessions with instructional resource reviewers across the state. A draft version of the guide was designed, and through several working months of revisions, the consumer guide was presented to the reviewers and other stakeholders to gather their feedback. That led to the guide being used for the professional learning pilot. During that pilot, we were able to gather more feedback as districts used it and then let us know what was working and what was not working within the consumer guide. We made additional adjustments to that guide and it is now published to the KDE website. And today we're training you all as regional cooperative mm -hmm. leaders and EPPs to understand the guide, the purpose and the resources that are embedded. We will also give the regional cooperative leaders some dedicated time to be able to practice using the training materials so you will feel comfortable going out into the districts you work with and support to make sure the participants will be able to use them effectively. So for our agenda today, we'll be together until around noon. So I will begin with a brief introduction and an overview of why materials matter for Kentucky students. The KDE team will provide an overview of the consumer guide and do a deep dive into some of the key tools that are embedded. We'll have a break around 1030-ish, and then we'll provide some tips and tricks for supporting districts, pre-service educators and leaders using the consumer guide. We'll have around 30 minutes of work time in the breakout groups for the regional cooperative leaders, and the EPPs will have a chance to debrief on all of the content that we went over today. Most importantly, you all will have access to a folder with all the templates that you can use to create trainings that you will provide for your districts, pre-service teachers, and other leaders. And then we'll wrap up around noon with some closing uh, next steps. So for our learning today, I just wanna voice over a few norms on this slide. 
first, please take care of yourself as a learner and attend to your needs. Attending virtual sessions is very difficult, but make sure that your needs are, you know, being kept and, and utilized. Uh, we have a break midway through, so if you need to step away for a second, stretch, grab something to drink, please practice some self-care. We will also have some opportunities for discussions in breakout groups, as well as whole group discussions. Please remember to honor every voice and experience and practice vulnerability and trust. We encourage everyone to be a focused, engaged contributor in our whole group discussions and in your breakout groups. The chat feature is there for you to use, and then please come off mute to engage with the content when necessary. Finally, let's center students in our conversations and in our work today. We will have some opportunities to talk about the impact of instructional resources on students and educators across Kentucky. And we would love to hear from you when you have questions, ideals, or comments about the content that we will go over. So we have a couple of tools that we'll utilize in today's training. In Zoom, we have breakouts and we will use the chat feature throughout the day. So again, feel free to drop questions in the chat or come off mute when it is necessary. We have a participants folder and Thomas will drop that link in the chat. That is where you will find all the resources that we will go through today, including the published consumer guide that is now on the KDE's website um, and your participants handout. So just feel free to make a copy and take any notes that you feel is necessary. Also in the participants folder, you will have access to the deck that you all will be working on later today. And finally, your colleagues are here to help you. Again, if you have any questions or if you run into right. anything, please let us know when you're in your breakout rooms and we can ask, you can also use the ask for help feature and we'll get things sorted out. So before we get into the content, just a quick note on words. Ed Report uses the term high quality instructional materials across our website and across our programs, textbooks and resources. So the Kentucky Department of Education uses the term instructional resources, which is defined in Kentucky law as the print, non-print, and electric medium designed to assist student learning. We'll primarily use instructional resources throughout this presentation today, but you might notice instructional materials is used on some specific ed report slides. Just consider that instructional materials and instructional resources are interchangeable in today's presentation. So just a little background around Ed Reports. We are a nonprofit organization that helps teachers, administrators, and leaders seek, identify, and demand the highest quality instructional materials on the market. We use expert educators in reviews and our process. We support districts, states, and schools in adoption processes that helps teachers get the best high quality materials across the country so they can utilize them with the students in their classrooms. We pride ourselves on doing this work and with practicing educators in the field. We are also known as for educators by educators organization. Our curriculum review teams consist of five practicing educators selected for their content expertise who reflect a diversity of roles across states and different grade levels. Our diverse teams ensure multiple perspectives look extensively at all elements of the core curriculum. Our reviews are led by teachers from across the country who meet weekly to collect evidence and create those reports that are published on our website. The reviewers spend roughly around 150 hours collecting, synthesizing, and writing those reports in a review cycle. What's interesting is that every reviewer on the review team touches every single page of the material. To carry out the organization's mission, Ed Reports evaluates comprehensive year-long curriculum materials for their alignment to high-quality instructional expectations. We share tools and rubrics so states, districts, and schools can use them to evaluate prior to adoptions and provide the resources to aid in the selection or implementation of instructional materials. We also support states and districts with the capacity building aspect to help them identify and select high quality instructional materials. Ed Reports provides a range of resources to help educators identify high quality instructional materials. However, we do not recommend materials for adoption. We do not evaluate materials for efficacy or recommend any specific pedagogical beliefs or approaches to create instructional materials. 
Additionally, it is also important to note that we do not receive payment from any publishers for our reviews that are published. This allows us to focus on the services we do provide and issue the unbiased reports for consumers to use. So with that, we wanna move into our first session, which is why instructional materials matters for Kentucky students, which is also why instructional resources matter for Kentucky students. So here's a, here are some reflection questions that we're gonna ask you to listen for as we move through this particular section. Thinking can be held on your participants handout and we'll have an opportunity for you to share your thoughts and reflections in just a little bit. So for just the next few slides, you will see some interesting data and stats and I'll provide you a moment to read through the slides individually first and then I'll voice over some important points. So there are many factors that influence what happens in the classroom, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to the teacher, the student, and the content. That is what drives learning. Dr. Matt Chingos and Russ Whitehurst conducted a study and they discovered that the materials teachers use directly affects what they teach and how they teach. In context, research, research supports the importance of all three equally, the student, the teacher, and the materials. So on this slide, it identifies teachers having access to high quality instructional resources as a top funding priority. Teachers that use instructional resources every day with their students are very clear that their resources that they're using in their classroom are not yet aligned. And if they were given the choice, they would prioritize funding for high quality instructional resources. That is huge when we think about all of the reasons why we want um, our classrooms to be top notch and at the top of the list is high quality instructional resources. So this slide is probably one of my favorite slides. A 2017 RAND analysis found that teachers spend seven to 12 hours per week searching for and creating instructional resources. When searching online sites such as Teachers Pay Teachers, Google, and Pinterest, teachers draw from a variety of free and paid sources. Many of them are often unvetted to piece together materials that they need for their classrooms. This practice can lead to inconsistent quality that impacts the students from low income backgrounds and communities of color the most. This indicates that teachers are spending hours that they do not have outside their working time trying to find materials to piece together that they want for high quality instructional materials when we know they're out there and they don't have to go looking for them. So when looking at online supplemental resources, the pie chart on the left shows they are often weakly aligned or offer limited supports to students. In this 2019 study, you can see that most of the materials vary in the sense of not aligned, weakly aligned, or mostly aligned. The pie chart to your right shows resources that are online, offer no supports, limited supports or some supports for students that need differentiation or from special populations. This is a big concern as you think about all the websites that are available out there and they don't have what teachers need in terms of the supports they need for student learning. ENTMP's Opportunity Myth show that students are spending 581 hours of a total 720 hours on assignments that are not grade level appropriate, especially students of color and students living in poverty. This is an equity issue.
So in reflecting on the challenges we just covered, it's also important to think about the consequences that may result when educators do not use high quality instructional materials. Nationwide, 40% of college students, including 66% of black college students and 53% of Latinx college students, take at least one remedial course in college, learning the skills that they were already told they had mastered in high school. This research comes from the opportunity myth. These college remediation courses cost approximately $1.5 billion annually. Additionally, even graduates who opt for a career straight out of high school are not faring much better because employers are reporting that high school graduates are missing the skills needed to do their jobs well. The lack of high quality instructional materials extends far beyond what we see in our K-12 schools and materials matter for the future livelihoods of our students and their families in Kentucky. So the State of the Materials Market Report is a feature that Ed Reports releases almost yearly. This report looks at what is happening in materials from year to year based upon our work in the organization and what we're observing in the field. Here you will see some information that came out from our latest report. Number four really stands out the most to me. Teachers want materials that are aligned to the standards they want the support for multilingual learners, and they also want instructional materials and resources that provide culturally relevant content and approaches, but few believe materials meet those needs. To put that in context, there are materials that meet those standard alignments that provide the desired supports for students, but teachers are not aware of them. They don't know they exist. However, the Consumer Guide will help districts and pre-service teachers and leaders become aware of the high quality instructional resources that they will need, that will meet their needs and that are fully vetted. The state of the materials market report also shows where materials are in terms of meets, partially meets or does not meet, which is also our rating system scale on ed reports of the red, yellow, and green. Of all the math materials that we have reviewed, 71% meet or partially meet expectation. This is outstanding news as there are dozens of programs that are high quality and represent every grade level that districts can choose from. In other words, districts can now have choices than ever before, more choices than ever before, as they seek to match their local priorities, especially in mathematics. So let's pause and give you an opportunity to reflect. You can drop things in the chat come off mute, or share any reflections that you might have captured from your participants' handout. You can share from any of the questions below, and we would love to hear your voice. So what are some things that resonated with you about why resources matter? What data surprised you in some of the slides that we shared? Or what connections do you see to your own work to the needs of Kentucky educators and students? We have one Sharon. Thank you. It's interesting in the last chart about the shift over the past few years of more materials meeting and less not meeting. Yes, that's one of the things we're really excited about, especially in the mathematics world. We have a lot of great materials that's on the market. Some are free. A lot of great materials are free. And so districts now have more choices than ever before selecting high quality instructional materials. Oh, we're excited. Thank you. Surprise 71%. Um, we'll go over that in just a little bit into training and I'll share where you can find all that information and those reports. Absolutely. They don't do not have or do not believe there's good resources because they spend so much time looking for those. Equity. Not equity. Even. Go ahead, and Stephanie, I would even add to that what Lisa had said. I think that seven to 12 hours is probably it could even be higher. We know that. <clears throat> absolutely and I can connect to that just leaving the classroom recently 
that I would spend every weekend collecting, trying to find, piece together high quality instructional materials for geometry, algebra, algebra two. Um, there's great materials for K-5, but finding those for high school was very difficult. Um, I would utilize Ed Report's website quite often to try to locate those materials. I think that uh, it's important that EPPs help their pre-service teachers make that connection, uh, the importance of using high quality resources uh, in their classrooms. Yes. Definitely, thank you. <clears throat> And Coletta, when you think about especially new teachers going in that first year, they're just trying to survive oftentimes and they don't know what they don't know and what really makes high quality or not. So the more support they get around that, just the impact that could have on that first year coming into the classroom. Yes. And, and I think that's where our, our faculty, uh, the importance of them having the knowledge of, yes. of stressing that as they progress through our program. Yeah. This is Molly from CKEC, and um, I also teach for the Cumberlands, specifically a group of option six candidates. But with CKEC, I'm the equity uh, coordinator, and I run a, another grant called MENT, Mentoring and Ex Inspiring New Teachers. So we have a team of coaches that goes out and works with new teachers from, they could be option six as well, but up to three years. They just don't have, even in, in college, we, we don't show them that vetting process. And so they lean into bad habits that other teachers have um, had to re, you know resort to, like the teacher pay teachers and we you know whatever you can find on the internet and whoever's created what you know other resources for them. So it makes me think of like even a tiered support for teachers. Uh, that are different skill levels on how to vet, knowing what to use, what's high quality. So I think about that with new teachers, but I also think about at the district level, sometimes we get new programs, but we don't necessarily, for whatever reason, communicate properly of what programs we're no longer going to be using. So then we have teachers that have too many resources. Then you, even if they're vetted, you don't have a consistent structure that you're using those resources within. And Molly, we talk a lot about in our work, the importance of professional learning on the backside of adopting an HQIR because teachers need the supportive because they're so comprehensive in nature. How do they effectively then implement what's within that HQR and how you can't have that separate? Those two things have to go together. Taking up um, Rachel's comment in the chat, it was interesting. <clears throat> yes, it's a common sense when you see the rigor of these resources, thinking my kids aren't up for that. And maybe in my teacher practice, I'm not, I'm not yet feeling up for getting them there. One of the surprising bits from the <clears throat> from recent research on this, we saw at the Instructional Materials Professional Development convening in Chicago just a little while back, the data suggests that actually kids are about as successful on assignments from a high quality instructional resource as they are on assignments of lower quality, with the inference being because of all of the scaffolding and support provided, they're actually able to do that more rigorous work at least as successfully as they were the less rigorous work that they'd been accustomed to. Thank you all for all the great comments in the chat. And keep those coming as, as you go through today and really look at the consumer guide. And as we continue to present on these resources, um, keep dropping things in the chat. Great connections and great talking points. So I want to make note that you will be able to use all these slides and the stats shared as a part of your presentation that you will give to your district's pre-service teachers and leaders. Um, so next up, we will hear from Misty and Fox as they provide you an overview of the math consumer guide. And so, hang on, we're switching screens here a little bit. Can you all see my screen now? Is that up and showing? Fox? Yes. Okay, thank you, Lisa. All right, so moving on into this next section, we really just want to focus on providing you an update um, or an overview of the Math Consumer Guide. And just quickly, good morning, everyone. My name is Missy uh, Higgins, and like Crystal said earlier, Fox and I will be presenting this part of KDE's portion of the training. And our goals in this section, we really do want to provide you some um, background context on the purpose of KDE's Consumer Guides. We want to look at the overall structure of our new Math Consumer 
consumer guide, spend some time digging into the KDE characteristics of high quality math instructional resources, as well as just a little time to explore a couple of the key tools in the math consumer guide to support districts in the selection process. So there are several tools within the consumer guide, but there are two that we do want to spotlight that the districts found especially helpful during the math pilot. So let's start with some background context around this work. In March of 2020, the KDE released the curriculum development process to provide districts with a systematic approach that they could use to develop and implement a local curriculum that's supported by high quality instructional resources. And on this slide, you can see the most recent version of the CDP, that's just our shorthand for the curriculum development process, which consists of four phases, preparing for the process, articulating a K-12 instructional vision, developing the curriculum, and then implementing and monitoring the curriculum over time. Now, the first step in phase three, this is where the district curriculum development team identifies, evaluates, and selects a high quality instructional resource that's aligned to their instructional vision that they created back in phase two. And that HQIR is then used in the development of their local curriculum. While the CDP provides general guidance that can be applied to any content area, we recognize that there needed to be more support right here specifically around phase three, step one, in selecting HQIRs that are aligned to the Kentucky academic standards for each content area. KRS 156405 also establishes the need for the KDE to provide a consumer guide to our schools and districts to support the evaluation and selection of instructional resources. So based on all of this, we set out to create consumer guides for each content area with the focus on the math consumer guide this past school year. So this slide shows you the layout and the organization of the math consumer guide. So it's just a snapshot from the table of contents. And this structure and format will stay the same in all of our other content area consumer guides because we want to maintain that consistency across the documents. So it's going to open up with an introduction that is going to provide some background context, connections to the curriculum development process, and it's going to spotlight a little bit of that rationale around the importance of HQIRs. Now, the second section is what makes this unique to the content area, because it is going to focus in on those specific characteristics of high quality, in this case, math instructional resources. And that section opens up by first framing around KDE's general definition of HQIRs. So there are six characteristics included in our general definition of HQIR. So please take a moment to review those on the slide. As you can see, first and foremost, for something to be considered an HQIR, it has to be aligned with the Kentucky academic standards for the content area. So to help understand what that looks like in math, the next subsection is going to highlight the specific markers that should be considered when identifying and evaluate or evaluating resources to ensure that they are aligned to the CAS for mathematics. Now, the markers were drafted through a back and forth collaboration between our math consultants and ed reports, and they're based on the CAS for mathematics and the instructional resources alignment rubric that's linked later in the consumer guide. And so within this section, you're going to find four markers that we have identified, and each one is going to include some explanatory text, bulleted considerations, and linked resources. So our four math markers include focus on grade level content, target of the standard and cognitive complexity, standards for mathematical practice, and then access to standards for all learners. Now, in just a minute, when you get into the consumer guide, you're going to notice that after that very first marker, there's like this visible speed bump that we've put in gray, and it is going to caution users to not proceed any further in their evaluation of a potential resource if first and foremost, it is not sufficiently focused on grade level content. At that point, we would say move on to the next potential uh, resource that you're going to evaluate. 
So we do want to give you an opportunity to individually read through our math markers. Now, Thomas is going to put a link in the chat for you to access the consumer guide. And what I want to do is just pause for a second, give you a chance to open up that consumer guide in its own tab on your computer. And you're also going to want to have your participant handout in front of you. So I'll pause just a second, let you get that opened up and get your participant handout. Then I'll come back and give you kind of the focus or the purpose for your reading. And then just so you know, it seems like a couple of people are having an issue accessing the participant handout, but if you use the participant folder or link, you should be able to access the handout through that link as well. So here's what we're going to do. As you read, we would like for you to think about what information seems most important in helping districts evaluate resource for evidence using each marker. The marker section begins on the top of page five, and it's going to go all the way through page six. There is space at the bottom of page one of your participant handout to capture your thinking as you read. But if you're having any trouble with the participant handout, just grab some paper and have it in front of you where you can make notes on it. So we're going to give you all about four minutes to read through that marker section. Um, and again, just capture your thinking on the handout or on some paper in front of you. So what questions can we answer or is anyone having any issues accessing the consumer guide itself? All right. I went, ahead, I went ahead and grabbed paper, but just an FYI, even in the folder, I don't know if it's happening to others, but I'm connected with my CKEC account and I still can't access the hmm. participant um, handout, but I'm able to access the other documents. So I have that and I've got my notes, but just to let you know that it's not even working in the folder for me. Thank you, Molly. And we'll work behind the scenes right now to kind of get that figured out for you all. So okay. we're going to pause right now and give you all about four minutes to read through those markers.
going to give you about one more minute, but I do want to let you know, if you refresh that link to the participant handout, it should be working now. Okay, let's come back together. I know you may not have fully gotten through that, and that's okay because you're getting ready to go into breakout rooms. You'll have a little more time to kind of discuss that. But what we do want to do is give you an opportunity to process what you read with some other people. So in your breakout rooms, you're just going to have a team discussion focused on the information that you noted as most important in helping districts to evaluate resources for evidence using each marker. Um, please feel free to capture any important uh, information that emerges from that team discussion. Um, in the same space on page one of your participant handout. So we're going to give you about four to five minutes in these breakout rooms. And again, open discussion. Just make sure to equitably share that airtime. And what information did you note as most important in helping districts to evaluate resources using those markers? So breakout rooms are going to open here in a minute. You should receive an invite to join. And we will see you back here in about five minutes. And please let us know if you're having any issues getting into breakout rooms. I see some of you all coming back in. Wait just a little longer for everyone to get back in here with us. Again, welcome back as you're coming back into the main room. I think we got about half the group back now. I think some are taking it down to the wire, every bit of the conversation they can have in there. <laughs> yeah, and I, I did make the the error of not putting the closing time at 10 seconds instead oh, of right. an extra minute. So hopefully got a little extra minute of, of discussion in. <laughs> and again, everyone just waiting for those last breakout rooms to come back to us. That was good conversation. <laughs> And so we would love, I heard someone just say that was good conversation. So we would love to hear some of what you all were talking about. So what information did your team discuss as like most important in helping districts to evaluate resources using those markers? So please feel free to unmute and share, or you can post your thinking in the chat. But what did you all discuss? I was the one, this is Molly, and I, we had four in our, in our group with a varied, you know, background experiences, not necessarily all of us had a, a math content background. Mm -hmm. So two things, we all four really kind of honed in on, I guess it was marker two around the connections to learning targets and how we can have good intent and our curriculum maps or pacing guides can be well-written around standards. However, when we don't know how to appropriately deconstruct those standards or we change the verbiage in the learning target, like we've all seen that regardless of the content, um, how changing the verbiage could actually, you know, compromise the integrity of that standard. But then, and I don't know which person in our group said it, but it was like, we talk about grade level. And so as a former high school math teacher, you know, I know grade level is also kind of subjective, uh, depending on the course that the ninth grader or the 10th grader or the eighth grader is in. So I know like geometry 
is going to have a different association with it or the same association with it really regardless of grade level you're still teaching geometry but it was like I had this big aha moment when she asked that question around just like clarity of the like as you get into the older grades and I'm going how many other people and she even said like as a parent I'm like there might need to be a clarifying statement around grade level I didn't see that as a math person I just kind of assumed you know grade level is still geometry we're still keeping geometry standards but that could be very different you could have a sophomore or a junior taking geometry but you could also have an eighth grader taking the same geometry course so I, I don't know that was that was really in, interesting to me and I think an easy way that we could clarify that and we do put this in some other documents it's grade level and or like course sometimes we use that word course mm -hmm. especially at the high school level um to help make that distinction so good feedback thank you any other things that came out and again um to the KDE team I can't see the chat so if you want to share anything that's popping up in the chat uh, Misty, Rachel Holbrook in the chat said, we discussed how many teachers still don't know the mathematical practices and are not familiar with understanding the levels. Of complexity. Of complexity, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I'm having like a bunch of things. A, a, bunch of there. Uh, a, a bunch of notifications came up right at that moment. <laughs> Absolutely. Like <laughs> Other noticings. Are yeah. you noticed? Sorry, <laughs> to kind of jump in on that a little bit, um, our group, one of the things we discussed was the that balance between conceptual, procedural, and applications. Um, I think oftentimes we hone in on that procedural, and sometimes those, those resources that aren't so high quality hone in on that procedural knowledge, but they don't focus on the conceptual, which we as math teachers know is so important uh, when we're working with students. Yeah, that's a fantastic that's observation. Yes. <clears throat> And that's the thing that often distinguishes an HQIR from just a regular instructional resource to your point, Johnny, absolutely. Any other thoughts before we move on? Um, our group realized or kind of noticed it was hard to pick just one of the markers and it's more the process. Yes. And so, you know, we really talked about as cooperatives, we are really helping the, the teachers that are currently in, in schools to understand this process. And then the pre-service universities are helping our, you know, our incoming teachers. And, and it's a tricky balance because those incoming teachers are coming and seeing, you know, people using Teachers Pay Teachers and Google and that that's, they, they don't wanna say that that's bad or wrong since, the, and neither do our institutions of higher ed cause like they wanna maintain relationships. Um, but how it really kind of is, I think, I can't remember who used it, but kind of like middle out, like this is a process that we are really kind of teaching all of our teachers in a practice that we need all of them to be using so that we're serving all students um, and how important it is to really think about that wraparound for everybody that's doing this. Then we took it off on a tangent about how to apply this process to creating some SEL resources because there were two <laughs> SEL specialists in there. Well, and Rachel, I would even say, you know, the intent of this resource is not even just teachers, because we know for this to truly be impactful, we need to have coherence across the district. So this is a district process that's very inclusive of the different stakeholders. So even thinking as EPPs and cooperatives, how are we helping our leaders to understand the importance of this work and equipping our teachers, but also involving them in this process of selecting resources? So for time's sake, I am going to move us on. But again, we just want to say, we talked about this when we sent you into breakout rooms. We are loving the conversations you all are bringing to the table. We absolutely appreciate all of the engagement um, with you all today. So just kind of moving on. So the markers, those are what are going to help us ensure that we have alignment to the Kentucky academic standards, which again is that first part of KDE's general definition of HQIRs. Now let's jump down to the last two bullets. So in order for something to be considered high quality, it needs to be culturally relevant, free from bias, and accessible for all students. And those are addressed in the next subsection that's going to focus on the five equity lenses with the specific math look-fors. 
And so to support schools and districts in selecting equitable resources, a detailed table of the equity lenses, it's linked into the consumer guide and it provides guidance on what you're looking for in math resources. Um, so we partnered with leading educators to help us craft those specific look fors um, in math resources aligned back to the five equity lenses. And then throughout the consumer guide, we're going to have multiple connections back to the lenses, as well as suggestions on how to use them in each step of the selection process. So in just a minute, we're going to put the link to the actual equity lens document in the chat for you so you don't have to go through the consumer guide to get to it. But I want to orient you to the document first. So when you open it up, on the left hand side, the first column, it's going to list the five equity lenses. Now these lenses stay the same across all of our content areas. The second column will provide you with a general description of what do we mean by that equity lens. And again, the same across all con or content areas. The last column is going to give you those specific math look fors aligned back to each of the equity lenses. So that's where we really want you to kind of focus your time in just a minute is that last column that is unique to math. And so we do want to give you some time to individually read through the um, equity lens document with those specific math look fors. And as you read, we want you to keep the following question in mind. It, again, very similar to the last question, but which of these considerations just in general seem most important in really helping districts to evaluate resources using these equity look fors? So Thomas is going to put a link to the equity lens document in the chat. We want you to focus your reading on that last column with the specific math look for us. So we're going to give you about four to five minutes to read through those. There is space on page two of your participant handout to capture your thinking, or again, just use some paper that you have in front of you. But which of those considerations, again, do you see as really being um, helpful to districts in evaluating resources? So what questions can we answer? All right, we'll pause now and give you about four minutes to read through that last column of the document.
Let's come back together. And I know you may not have gotten through all of that um, and that's okay. But for this one, we're going to just stay whole group um, instead of going into breakout rooms. So what are some things maybe that you noted that seem important or really resonated with you in helping districts to evaluate resources using those equity look for? So again, please feel free to unmute and share or you can post your thinking in the chat. Well, Misty, one of the things that really um, spoke to me was the um, column about students leading learning that's meaningful and relevant. Mm -hmm. um, because until we give students the opportunity to really jump into, you know, talked about authentic tasks, yes. um, collective activities, collaboration, where they're discussing and interacting with that content so they have a deep level of understanding. Um, so just, you know, looking for those resources that allow that deep dive for kids and that real immersion and interaction with the content. Yes. Thank you, Cindy. And I believe this morning someone posted in the chat, they were looking for connections to that United We Learn vision and the student experience. And I think, Cindy, you <clears> just <throat> captured so much of that deeper learning aspect of what should be happening in the vibrant student experience. And then from the chat, connecting students with their families, communities, previous knowledge and experiences is, is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other thoughts? One of the things for me that I was thinking about is that second row there, especially, you know, looking at the tasks and questions to bring in other cultures, context, languages, connecting vocabulary to students' home languages and so on. Is there a rubric that has been created to help to discern that and figure that out. Because um, when I was looking even on ed reports, like I didn't notice that it said anything particularly about this. So how might you go about judging how well um, a, a set of resources actually does that? And I will, on the KDE side, Mark, say we do not at this point have rubrics to support that. Stephanie, I'll I'll kind of lean in on you from Ed Reports because there are indicators that kind of look at some of those pieces. I just don't know if it's all of those pieces, Stephanie. Yeah, you're exactly right, Misty. We do have some indicators on our websites, especially in Gateway 3, mm -hmm. um, around student supports and teacher supports around equity, um, specifically around 3N, 3P, 3Q, and, and those specific indicators but as far as judging these we we don't um there's work in ed reports that's going to be coming out later on with mll support we've got some rubrics in that making but as far as these specific ones just what you see in those um reports is what we look at and so, Mark, I would even recommend a little bit later when you get a chance to explore some on um, Ed Report's website, look at those specific indicators and see if what they're looking at is, is something that could support around that. Um, so you said it was Gateway 3, correct, Stephanie? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Any other thoughts before? Oh, sorry, Mark, go right ahead. No, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I'll look at those specifically and see. Yeah. Anything else before I hand it over to Fox? There was a wondering how many national curriculum resources will address tasks that are open ended and when possible connected to a local um, to a local or community issue um, with the note that that um, this person created uh, Krista created um, tasks many times because I wanted to address local issues my students would connect with so from national resources, how do we make those local ties without the teachers having to furnish that. And Fox, you and I, even in a lot of the guidance, we talk about how no one singular resource is going to do everything. And mm -hmm. when it comes to that piece right there, that local context, that is one of the hardest things that you're going to be able to find in a national resource. And so looking at mm -hmm. supplemental resources that can fill the gaps that you see in the main resource that you um, select. All right, Fox, I will hand it over to you. Okay. <clears throat> 
So we're, we're going to come back now to the table of contents. And the final section of the guide takes districts through the process of identifying, evaluating, and selecting HQIRs for mathematics. For each step of the process, the consumer guide includes a brief description of the purpose of the step, key questions the committee should consider as they work through that step, and then key tools to support the work. So as you know, last year, Senate Bill 1 was passed into law and shifted responsibility for developing the curriculum and for selecting instructional resources from the SBDM to the local superintendent. When you look at the language of this law, which is now part of KRS 160345, this work is to be done in consultation with each school's SBDM and the local board of education. It also calls for a reasonable review and response period for stakeholders throughout the process. So to support districts in adhering to Senate Bill 1, considerations for stakeholder inclusion and communication are embedded throughout the CDP, with guiding questions for each step where inclusion and communication are most critical. So we're going we're gonna to use and return to this graphic just to help us visually map our movement through the four parts of the HQR selection process. And this begins with determining selection criteria based on a district's instructional vision and the markers for high quality mathematics resources from section two of the consumer guide. So let's just consider for a moment now what feeds into determining the selection criteria a curriculum team will use to identify and then later to evaluate resources. So determining selection criteria draws upon the instructional vision, characteristics from the consumer guide, specifically those markers and equity lenses, and stakeholder input. So these are distilled into a manageable set of criteria the curriculum team can then, use, can then develop into a tool, which often takes the form of a rubric for evaluating resources and then capturing and holding that evaluative thinking to be used later. Taking up the element of stakeholder input, the purpose of this tool, Sample Stakeholder Questions for Mathematics, which was adapted from instruction partners and leading educators, is to guide that input gathering from three core stakeholder groups. So first teachers, then families and communities, and then students. This guidance is critically important since it's stakeholder input. That's what really makes selection criteria and the selected resource that eventually follows curricular pieces that everyone owns and can commit to. And it may be helpful to know there are aspects of the stakeholder questions that are general in nature and will be common across content areas as further guides are developed, and then aspects specific to each particular content area. So obviously today we're thinking about mathematics. So we're going to pause now and give you some time, about three minutes, to individually explore this tool. In three minutes, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get some meaningful exploration, but it'll be a little bit, it'll be a little bit tight. So as you do, envision what use of this tool might look like in a district and which aspects of this resource stand out as most helpful and or insightful. So remember there's space on page two to quickly um, jot some thinking in your participant handouts. The link is now in the chat or should be here shortly. And we're gonna come back together in about three minutes. So are there any questions I can answer for you before we have some time to explore? the sample stakeholder questions. Okay, we're gonna take about three minutes to do that, holding, jotting some thinking quickly on page two of your participant handout.
Yeah, take about another 10 seconds just to bring that last thought you might be recording to a close. Okay. <clears throat> so sharing out a bit now before we move on. Um, if you would post one idea in the chat you noted as to what use of this tool might look like in a district or which aspects of this resource stand out as most helpful or insightful. So if you will, just post something that stood out to you, either thinking about what it might look like use of this tool in the district or a particular aspect of it that stood out as potentially especially helpful or insightful. Think about this as a tool to help inform those selection criteria for resource identification and evaluation. Uh, considering how to address teacher input based on level of experience. Thank you. <clears throat> I like that. Yeah, stakeholders, they're not always clear on how their input can be helpful. And so having something that really can guide them into knowing how to find that helpful fit. Thank you. The questions elicited much deeper thinking about the math than most conversations I've heard about textbook adoption. And then Rebecca had a comment about the summative questions at the end. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Mary is appreciating the, the student perspective and, and the community input are included, especially hearing from our kids and, and dealing them into the conversation about if we're going to be if we're going to be evaluating um, potential resources, um, having their input as to what really matters as a part of the process. Yeah. Okay, and a last thought. Um, and families as stakeholders. Yes, yes. Oftentimes, you know, there's there's a felt disconnect um, between district work and some and curriculum work, maybe in particular in families, and really having them feel a part of it and feeling their place as stakeholders. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so transitioning on, we're going to take a look. Um, once the the selection criteria have been finalized, the next step is to use them to help you identify potential HQIRs that meet those criteria. And after the markers help us to ensure alignment to the CAS, to our Kentucky Academic Standards, which is the first component of KDE's gen general definition of HQIRs, the second and third components tell us they need to be research-based and or externally validated and comprehensive. So for mathematics resources, ed reports is a primary means of external validation that also addresses the various dimensions. So the, the books, multimedia, tasks, assess assessments, et cetera of a resource that would make it truly comprehensive. The KDE's Instructional Resources Alignment rubrics found on kystandards.org can also help inform resource identification. Once the finalized selection criteria have been embedded in an evaluation tool, and again, that often takes the shape of a rubric, the next step is to use that to evaluate a narrowed group. Typically, it's down to two to four by that point of potential resources. As we gather feedback from the districts in our reading writing pilot, we definitely recognize there was a need to create a resource to help guide conversations with vendors to support the narrowing of options and final selection of a primary HQIR. The sample HQIR vendor questions for mathematics has evolved from that original draft created in partnership with Achievement Network for the reading writing pilot, and it now includes a wider range of potential questions a district might ask of HQIR vendors to really make sure districts are selecting the best resource according to their instructional visions and are also set to get the vendor support needed for effective implementation. So this tool is designed to offer productive uh, categories for inquiry, suggest where leverage might lie in vendor conversations, and then also just help with crafting wording to get needs addressed. So we're going to take about two minutes, maybe a little longer here, to explore the sample HQIR vendor questions for mathematics. 
As you do, please consider the following prompt. So what might be a productive question or questions you could ask that you may not have thought to ask or a productive question or questions that you didn't know you could ask of a vendor? So feel free to hold your thinking again on page two of the participant handout and we'll have posted a link to the tool in the chat. So again, what might be a question you might not have thought to ask or even a question you didn't know that you could ask of a vendor? So we'll take time to think about that. Take about two minutes, maybe a little more. We can hold some thinking before we come back and share out together whole group. Take about 10 more seconds now to note a final thought you might be working on. Okay, coming back together again now. So we're gonna post either one question that seems especially productive to ask of a vendor or one you might not have, have known you could ask in the chat. So if everybody would, again, post a question, either one that seems especially productive to ask a vendor, a vendor potentially, or one you might not have realized that you could ask of a vendor. We'll, we'll post one of those in the chat before we maybe take a moment to, to share aloud. If... So how does the instructional resource support teachers in offering students opportunities to make decisions about how to improve as opposed to a way to determine if answers are right? Yes, yes. What are non-negotiable aspects of the lessons during early implementation that must remain intact to preserve the evidence-based integrity of the resource? And getting that clarity from the vendor side since they know the resource so well, absolutely. What professional learning services are provided at launch during early implementation and to onboard new staff later? So really getting clarity about the services the vendor offers to support those phases of, of implementation, the, those PL supports. And then trying to ensure timely delivery is also helpful. And what pedagogical supports, evidence-based instructional practices, et cetera, will help teachers deliver instruction that enables students to engage in tasks that promote problem solving and reasoning. Thank you. 
And we'll take about a moment this time as as some of the thinking continues to come in in the chat, just if anybody would would like to unmute and, and elaborate or add anything aloud. <clears throat> See the recognition that providing ongoing professional learning is in, and training is a must, absolutely. Just general appreciation, lots of great questions in the document. And the last one, yeah, any question around technological infrastructure, PL for teachers and updates to the resource are important to, important to consider, definitely. Would anyone like to unmute and amplify anything before we transition? Oh, and then my last comment on ongoing PL, um, but would like to dig in into further questions around linguistics and student, oh yeah, accountability for retaking, yes. Thank you. Okay, we will go ahead and, and transition forward then. So the fourth component of Katie's general definition is based on fostering vibrant student learning experiences. And this, compo this component was added somewhat recently to highlight how the rich engagement HQIR should afford connects to the United We Learn vision for public education in Kentucky. And we talked a little bit about United We Learn as it surfaced earlier. So United We Learn has multiple connection points to the curriculum development process and to HQIRs. While implementation of a local curriculum grounded in HQIRs can definitely be considered innovative and the process and certainly involves collaboration with communities, fostering vibrant student learning experiences is certainly at the core of this work and a primary aim of it. On that note, we're gonna move into breakout rooms now to build on the content and key resources. So again, we've talked about the markers, the equity lenses, um, the sample stakeholder questions and sample vendor questions um, that we've shared in this section. We're gonna have two tracks for you to potentially engage in in your breakout room. So if supporting districts and pre-service leaders and teachers and using a consumer guide is new for you, what other assets might you have to support that work? And then what additional supports might you need? If you supported districts um, and pre-service and or pre-service leaders and teachers and using the reading writing consumer guide, what did you find helpful in that work? And then what additional supports did it turn out that you might have needed to support it? So it's gonna be an open forum discussion. Uh, and so that means we'll please try to allow for all to be heard. Again, that equitable sharing of airtime. So you're gonna have about five minutes again in our breakout rooms. And I think the breakout room should be ready. And if anyone has any issues getting into a breakout room, again, we'll be here in the main room to help. So we'll go ahead and slide into breakout rooms now. <clears throat> It looks like everybody's making their way. And again, if anybody needs help, just let us know. I'm not seeing the participant count. So if somebody would just let me know. 
it looks right. like we're about about there, Fox. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to pull back together now, here, whole group, as we close out this section. <clears throat> so we we differentiated that, but but for both groups coming together, those new to supporting the work with a consumer guide and those who have supported the reading, writing consumer guide, what additional supports might you need? So what else might you need to really support that work? Um, so once you've had some think time, I'll invite you to unmute and share aloud or to post your thinking in the chat. So I'll give you just a little bit of think time. What, what extra supports, what additional supports, um, given your role and context, might you need? As you're ready, if you want to go ahead and either unmute and share aloud or post some thinking in the chat. So whether you're new to supporting work around a consumer guide or you, you did that with the reading writing consumer guide, what additional supports might you need? Supports of any kind. <clears throat> oh, it's something that came up in our breakout room and I would invite <laughs> maybe um, Faye if she feels comfortable sharing um, about it, um, was supporting free service teachers and actually getting copies of some of those HQRs so that yes. they can utilize them within their pre-service and. And I know, I feel like we had heard recently about um, one of our institutions who was kind of developing sort of a, a lab with some of those textbooks. So I don't know um, if someone might be willing to share more about that, but we just talked about the importance of actually getting those in to pre-service teachers' hands so that they can see what an HQR looks like and all the supports that are there so that they aren't as inclined to go into the classroom and, and start pulling from less reputable sites. Thank you. Yeah, really being able to, to, to get your hands on it and to, to really get a feel for the architecture and intent of it, the supports that are there. Absolutely. As, as much as you might hear about it, there isn't really a substitute for, for a more direct experience. Other thoughts? Lisa said you may not know it's needed until, you know, it's scrolled up. Oh, until you start using it. So someone to contact for questions. Absolutely. And Fox, I would say when it comes to getting samples of the HQIRs, I will say one of the nice things about math is there are several OERs yes. that are green rated. So we know sometimes it, it can be difficult if it's a for-profit kind of HQIR to get access to a sample, um, but there are several OERs that you could get access to that are green rated for math. Yeah, which would certainly be fine for getting that preliminary sense. Yeah. Yep. So I'm just noticing uh, from Johnny a couple a couple key takeaways. It's crucial to have teachers play a critical role in selecting the resources. Absolutely. Um, also, there are mixed messages from students and families about their feelings regarding digital resources. Yes, mm -hmm. and how that could be due to ac accessibility issues, limited access. Yes, absolutely. So being some again, that would show up sort of when we're thinking about our instructional vision and that local needs section and what are the feelings and what are what are the realities as far as that mix of, of print and, and digital resources might go. Any other thoughts that anybody wants to call out from the breakout room conversation, new thinking that may have that may have arisen? Um, anyone else on the call want to share anything that's that seems important to call out from the chat? <clears throat> I have a question. Really, it's I can't think in response to Rachel's comment mm -hmm. about a database. Yeah. Um, it seems like I've heard something about a database mm -hmm. working with some districts, but we don't, as people who are supporting districts in the work, is that a public database like on open house or is that just for districts or what? So the dashboard that we that we showed in March leadership, which does have that functionality, um, is available only to districts. So if district HQR coordinators complete a survey, they get access to the dashboard. And one of the features it does enable you to see what resources are being used by other districts around the state, which has some powerful 
networking possibility to, in order to sort to access. And we're, we've been having conversation while protecting sort of the, the privacy and the needs of the districts. How might we make some of that information more available, especially to cooperatives? Um, and so we're having some conversation there, but for now, really talking to your districts um, and, and, and kind of having indirect access through them and conversation with them would be the way to go. Well, and I think for districts to someone else's comment about who's using what and how long success stories, like if you want districts to network and the district isn't filling out that survey, then how do they know who's using what? Like, I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. Good problem to have. Just thinking. <laughs> so we have we had going into March leadership a pretty decent range of districts already reporting and then traveling the state and really making that push and and, and folks seeing value in the dashboard and, and some of the potentials that it has. Hopefully our database um, will continue to expand fairly rapidly. Yeah, I think Rebecca, prior to March leadership, we had 114 14. districts that yeah. had responded to that survey. Um, and I think that went up even a little bit more due to us kind of talking about it at March leadership. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and transition now into a five minute break, which puts us back at about 1042 if we're holding tightly to that five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you want to say 1045 and allow for a little extra stretching and hydration and whatnot. <clears throat> Okay, we'll see you back at 1045. <clears throat> All right, we'll go ahead and get started um, back. Um, it's 1045 according to my watch. And I just want to say welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your break, stretch break, and was able to get up and stretch your legs or grab something to drink or snack on. Now we'll get into the resources that are Ed Report specific, which will mostly be from our website, um, the Ed Reports website. So for these next couple of slides, I'm going to walk you through the Ed Reports website and highlight a couple of key features that you will likely find very beneficial, not for your own learning and information, but also to share with your districts and your pre-service teachers and leaders. In your slide deck, you'll see that there are a couple of slides or just screenshots of our website, and they have bullet points that go over either what is directly on that web page or how to navigate a specific section within our website. So I won't go slide by side, but I will do a live demonstration throughout our website. And you guys can see these from your slides of your training materials for your districts. Edreports.org is our website, and you're welcome to type that in your browsers and follow along as I demonstrate how to uh, navigate our website. So on this website, you'll be able to explore reports, access the various tools that we use and provide, and look at the evidence guides as well as additional resources that we, we allow districts and states and everyone to use. So I'll go ahead and click into our website. Okay. Can everybody, want, can everybody see my screen? Okay, perfect. So this is our website or Ed Reports homepage. And when you come to this page up here at the top, you can see we have Explore Reports and we currently offer ELA, Math and Science. One of the cool features is upcoming reviews. So if you're ever curious what we're um, reviewing right now in the process or what's in the pipeline, you can click on that link and it will show you what we have in the future of what we're currently reviewing that will be posted to our website very soon. But for today's purpose, we're going to click on mathematics. So once we get into the mathematics, 
all of our reports that we've ever reviewed from K-12 mathematics pops up. And if you scroll down, you can see it's a wide variety, um, very, there's 11 pages or more of math material. Um, what I would like to do is for today's purposes, just filter that down to K-8. So underneath the grade level, you have high school or you have K-8. Once you click K-8, it filters through all of the reports that we reviewed in the aspect of K-8. And then what you can end up doing is selecting any material that you use, your districts use, or, or pre-service teachers and leaders are looking at. Um, you just click on a title. And for this purpose, I'm just going to look at Imagine Learning Illustrative Mathematics, which is an OER um, that you know many districts can use as well. And when you click on that, there's a lot of information that pops up. One of the things that really pops up is the alignment. We want to make sure that um, that you know that if it's green, it meets alignment. And if there's another green, it meets usability, which is our gateways and the markers for KDE. So when we're really looking at the markers, you want to look to make sure that the alignment is there and the usability. And when we talked about our equity piece earlier, that is usually going to be in the usability section. One of the key features on the reports I want to show is the publisher's respond. So anytime that we review um, our materials, we send it back to the publishers and then they can either like just post it with no response or they can also, you know, reply to what we reviewed. So you can see here um, if a publisher has responded, you can read that little statement. It's usually just a quick statement from the publisher. Um, also, there is technology information. So um, this particular report a lot of times we don't know, like, is it compatible with the um, OE, the, the systems that we use in our districts? That information is there as well um, from the publishers. So those are really neat little uh, responses I wanted to pull out as well. But also I wanted to note is that we have... Uh, we're in version 1.5 of our tool. So as we have evolved, as materials have evolved, we have grown and we have changed and our, our, our tool, our review tool has um, grown as well. So if you see the version 1.5, that means it is currently the newest version is what we look at. It has all the new supports. Um, it is the one that's most up to date. Uh, you will see sometimes it's on the O tool, which is one. And that's important to know because um, the tools has changed just a little bit. And most of it has changed in usability, not in the alignment. Um, as you scroll on down, you can see the summary of alignment and usability within the reports. Um, you have tabs with math. So we're looking at K through five, but we also break down reports by grade, grade bands. So in this particular one, we're looking at K2, but you can also select from three, five just by clicking a different tab. Um, so you can read again the summary from alignment. And then once you're scrolling down just a little bit farther, you can look at the, the overview, the snapshot of the three grade band. So if you're looking at, okay, is this consistent across bands? Is this material um, really consistent? That's, that's something that we want to look at is making sure that the reports are very consistent and that, you know, kindergarten scored similar to sixth grade. We don't want the big gaps there as we have seen before in, in textbooks materials. Um, so once you get down there, you can look really quickly at snapshots of our gateways, and these are very similar to the KDE markers. So focus and coherence, we have our rigor and mathematical practices for the first two gateways, and that's our alignment. And then our gateway three, which is our usability, and that includes the equity pieces, the student supports, teacher supports, and technology aspects. Now, if I want to go into more depth, I can click on view full report. When I click on the full report, again, it's going to have the alignment um, summary, but then you can scroll down and you can see the different gateways. So gateway one, gateway two, and gateway three. We were talking about our equity piece earlier, and we said that's in gateway three. So if I click on gateway three, it breaks it even farther down into our teacher supports, our assessment piece, our student supports, and intentional design. The equity part is usually going to be in Criterion 3.3 with those student supports. Once I click on the student supports, it breaks down the indicators. Um, you can see that some indicators are scored and some are just narrative. So if you see the read part, we don't score that piece. We just provide an overview of that particular indicator. There's certain um, 
things that we look at in our guidance document, and those are within our report. So like if I click on the read, you can see the, the report is still very detailed. It, there's no difference in the scoring aspect to the narrative other than it's just not scored. The, the time and dedication that our reviewers put into these reports are same, the, the, tame, the same amount of time and everything. So um, just wanted to no make note of the, the score. So some are scored, some are just narrative reports that we we just look at and and report on what we read and what we see in in the in the report the materials. So um, as you can see, the reports are very detailed. Um, they are long and lengthy. And so sometimes it's very helpful to look at these reports knowing what you're looking for. So for example, if we're looking at the KDE markers, we know that we want to see strong alignment to the uh, math practices. We want to make sure that they're strong aligned with, with focus and coherence. So you really want to look at those and those are going to be in gateway one and two. Um, and then you can look at this as student supports. So that's basically how you read a report. If you're just looking at one, one of the cool features about our process is we can compare multiple um, publishers, multiple materials at one time. So you're going to want to compare some that are more costly or, or OERs. You can do that. So again, you go back to the Explore Reports, click on Math, cipher through your grade level. And then once you're there, you can compare up to three reports. You just click on Compare Reports. And then as you notice, whenever you hit compare reports, you're going to see this little plus sign that will add it to a cart, I call it. And then you can compare those. So in this particular situation, I want to compare kindergarten uh, for three different publishers. So I'm going to look at everyday math. I'm going to look again at imagine learning. And then I'm going to come down to reveal mathematics. So I've got all three of those in the cart. You click compare now. This is a really cool feature that can like sil uh, filter through what you're identifying. For example, if I look at everyday mathematics, I can see that it meets alignment, but it partially meets usability. So those supports, those equity pieces might be not as strong as what's in Imagine Learning and Illustrative Mathematics. So you can either delete that series, or if that is not no longer one of your considerations, then you can get rid of it and look at the other two. But if you do have everyday mathematics, if districts have that, maybe then now you know where the supports are needed. Maybe now you know where those supplementary materials need to come in to make those adjustments with those partially meets areas. Um, so I really enjoy looking at the overview of multiple grade levels. So again, you can see that kindergarten it looks like focus and coherence across the board meets the rigor. Um, one point is missing from Gateway 2 in Everyday Math, but Imagine Learning, McGraw-Hill, uh, Reveal Math, both get those points. And you can see the usability is about the same. So you can really filter through all of those scores to see wh what you're looking for. And not all greens are equal. So I really express that as you're looking for your local priorities and what your vision is, you really want to hone in to that Gateway 3 piece, those student supports, teacher supports. Um, the Gateway 1 and 2, which is uh, the KDE markers and our um, focus coherence, the standards for math pra mathematic practices, and our rigor are very similar, but usually where you're wanting to look at is that usability piece. So. Um, that is basically how you use our website to look at reports, the depth of the reports, how to compare, how to go in depth with reading the report. It's all right there for you to click on. Just make sure that you view the entire report to really dig into local priorities or looking at your vision that you're setting. Other things that we offer on our website is our process. And if you look up here at the top of the page and click our review tools, you can see exactly what we reviewers, our reviewers look at, which is really cool. We have all of our review tools from ELA down to science. And for today, we're going to just look at Math K-8. So when you click on Math K-8, you're going to see two different documents pop up. The first document I want to show is the evidence guides. And what I really love about the evidence guides is this is what our reviewers use. So when we put our reviewers on Teams, they 
start with these uh, documents and every document, all the guidance documents is 110 pages. So it's a long process. It's very vetted. That's why we're fully vetted. We spend a lot of time, six to eight months on our reviews. Um, we have our gateway information at the top, focus coherence. We have information about our criterion. We have information and purposes about this criterion. And then what we really have done is like took research and connected it to those criterions. Again, this is how we are fully vetted and we put out those unbiased reports. And then finally, we will look at the scoring for each criterion. Um, these are the documents here that our teams will utilize each week. We look at one indicator per week with the teams um, and they go in depth. So like the first week teams will spend working on looking at grade level content and see if it's applicable for the content uh, from earlier grades or so really looking at those assessments. And for this particular criterion, this particular indicator, it's all or nothing. Either the materials have grade level assessments or if it's above grade, then they get they have zero points. And we call that out in our reports and we identify what questions are above grade level. So sometimes you may see in our reports that unit eight of a series has X, Y, and Z questions that are above grade level. That is just because uh, we want our educators to know that if you make it to unit eight, you may have to do some pre-teaching for the next grade or make adjustments to that particular lesson or that assessment in order to get grade level content for all your students. Um, and again, these are what we use within our review teams. You can see how they look for evidence collection. We, we identify exactly what we're looking for and we identify what is mathematically reasonable. So there's no questions as teams are going in. Uh, there's discussions around those in our cluster meetings with all the discuss, discussion questions at the end. And then it repeats itself. So then we continue on. So that is our, that's our evidence collection tools. These are what our teams use. Um, I've used those myself as a former reviewer and they are very intense and very vetted. And then our other tool, this is the shorter version. It's 14 pages. It just has more information about our gateways, um, our scoring criteria. This is what I call the rubric. So like if you're looking for something really short, you're looking to vet materials, you would pull this, this document out and it just has the scores, it has the indicator language, and it has like total points. And it tells you whether it meets, partially meets or does not meet. So if you're looking at vetting your own materials, looking at your materials, you could utilize these um, rubrics and determine if they are um, equipped to what your vision is or your local priorities. So again, this is just over our three gateways. It's what our, our reviews are consist of, um, et cetera. And one final piece of our website is our resources. I love our resources page because we offer a wide area, a range of different resources that we have in helping educators, districts, leaders, um, everyone with finding why materials matter. Like if you're looking at specific uh, adoption steps, we have that. We have information, and my computer's being really laggy right now, but we have a lot of information about webinars. We have offered um, coffee chats um, in last year. So we had webinars and trainings. We have activities and protocols. We have articles, case studies, just different topics. So not just math, we have it all around and it just really supports hands-on learning and focuses on why materials matter for students everywhere. So that is our website in a nutshell. Um, lots of good information, a lot of um, great resources that we have available. And so what we're going to do now is we would like for you guys just a few moments to explore the website yourself. Um, and with that, we'll give you about three or four minutes just to visit the website on your own and navigate to look around and just make note of any questions you might have or anything you would like for me to clarify while we're all here together today. And as you're navigating the website, think about how the tools and resources would be beneficial for you working with your districts, pre-service leaders, teachers on how to use these resources. Um, so we'll take just a few moments and let you browse individually and we'll come back together in about four minutes as a whole group to discuss what you find on the website.
Okay. So hopefully that you had some time to explore website um, and got familiar with it, but I would love for anyone to come off mute or drop things in the chat, any observations or questions that you have, especially on how these tools and supports um, might help you with your districts that you support or the pre-service teachers and leaders in selecting high um, quality instructional resources. Stephanie, Mary Belcher from KVEC asked, uh, how do they determine if the resources for guided reports and if that's possible? Oh, yeah. Well, so it's not possible. We don't provide if they're free or not. Um, but sometimes like you can email our math department or email one of us at the ed reports and we can provide some of that on the side. Um, some of the OER websites, for example, like um, the Imagine Learning is usually free. Um, and I can't think of, there's one more, I think it's, um, I cannot remember, Great Minds, I think was free at one point, um, but there's very, there's not a lot, but there's a few, but we don't provide that information. Great question though. Really like to compare option because if districts isn't decided on a couple of the HQIRs, this would be really helpful. Yes, I agree with you. All right. Any other questions or talking points or anything about our website that you might have? Well, if you do, if anything pops up, feel free to email myself or someone from the KDE side. We would love to help and answer a great, you know, any questions or or be a support in any way possible. So for time's sake, we're going to move on in. We do want to provide some, you know, work time for our cooperative leaders. Um, so in this next section is going to be a really quick overview on how to support districts utilizing the consumer guide. But before we do that, we're going to hear from Misty really quickly. And um, Stephanie, you'll see there's some clicks that are kind of built into this slide. Sorry about that, um, <laughs> since you're the one controlling right now. But um, through both our reading and writing and math pilots, districts shared with us the lessons that they learned. And there were kind of three major ones that came up over and over that we wanted to share with you, because these are important to keep in mind as you think about providing supports, whether that's to districts, to pre-service teachers and leaders around this work. So the first one. They consistently spoke to, um, and if you don't mind clicking that one, Stephanie, uh, oh, you did, sorry. They consistently spoke to the need of that collaboratively created instructional vision um, that they did in um, connection with their stakeholders that reflects the standards current research for teaching and learning in the content area, as well as their local context. And when they did that, it then allowed them to truly use the instructional vision to as the main driver for the rest of the process. You know, and that includes when they were determining their selection criteria um, in terms of what they were going to use to help identify and evaluate potential HQIR. So that instructional visioning piece is so critical before moving straight into just what, what are we going to adopt? And then the second one, they also pointed out how essential clear communication and stakeholder inclusion was throughout the process to really develop understanding of the work um, and to build that necessary support and commitment for actual implementation. So if we don't get everyone involved in this process, what you're going to find is when you get to implementation, there are people who they don't understand why you adopted this one. They don't understand the vision behind it, and they're not really committed to actually implementing that in a way that's going to impact what's happening for students in the classroom. Um, and what we have done, we have built in several tools throughout the consumer guide, specifically focused on that communication and stakeholder inclusion. And then the third lesson, this really highlighted um, the importance around providing teachers and leaders with what we are calling curriculum-based professional learning to support effective implementation. Because it's one thing just to give them access to this, but because these are so comprehensive in nature and because it does sometimes cause an, a, a big shift in the way that they are approaching classroom instruction, they need professional learning. Um, and that includes things like initial training and just understanding the design of the resource and those 
non-negotiable aspects, as well as time for teachers engaged in um, unit and lesson internalization. And I just want to give a quick plug here to kind of let you all know our current work, what we are doing, we are in the research and development phase of a curriculum-based professional learning guidance document that we hope to release this fall that's really going to go into the what and how of curriculum-based professional learning. And it's going to contain multiple tools, resources, protocols um, that you can use, whether it's with districts or with your pre-service teachers and leaders, to help them really dig in and internalize everything that is within that HQIR. All right, thank you, Misty. So these next couple of slides is gonna provide you an overview of how to approach your deck customizations and your approach to create training materials. So when you're working with districts and the pre-service teachers and leaders that you support, you're really highlighting the most impactful or the significant things for them to know. So you will all have copies for this in your deck and in your participants folder, and you'll get an opportunity to work together to revise your decks to fit your specific co-op needs after this section. And I will voice over some of the recommendation sections and provide a couple of tips and things to consider when designing these slides or adding content to the information that is in your templates. And so for a two-hour training, what we recommend for your sections, and they should include like the welcoming introductions, why materials matter for Kentucky students, the um, consumer guide overview, the helpful hints and tools and the deep dives and in, in identifying high quality instructional resources. Some of the Ed Reports 101, including just framing and context, and then really to close out and next, uh, next steps after that. So with um, the welcoming introduction slides, we wanna keep it very similar to what we did today. We think it will be very helpful for you to provide the context and the framing and what to expect for the day. This gets participants the high level overview of the consumer guide, the purpose, the function, and it sets the framework for the in-depth sections. And then why the materials matter for Kentucky students section, you can all use the slides that are in your template deck However, keep in mind the national, the state, and the local data research on trends that are impacting the use of high-quality instructional resources. Use quantitative and qualitative data to show the impact that high-quality instructional resources have on the students and educators. This can come from information that is already in your templates or what you find elsewhere, including your region or your district-specific data that you can share as you're delivering your trainings. It is also helpful to make those connections onto why the need is there and how it connects to the Kentucky students and educators. And then just remember to embed opportunities to allow participants to react and inter interact with those data and discussions with each other. So on the consumer guide overview, we really want to get districts to deep dive and dig deep into section two during the consumer guide overview. Make sure that their instructional vision encompasses what is really in that section. It's also important to pick out just a couple of tools, very similar to what we did today, that you feel like is going to be most helpful for your districts that you serve. It would not be hospital. Uh, even possible to even cover all of those tools because you know the consumer guide has a lot of those built in. Um, so consider taking the information that you know about your districts and your regions and then finding out what the need is and try looking for those specific tools to deliver your training on. And then provide an overview of the tools and walk participants through the key features, very similar to what we did today. Provide participants that wait time and that time to really think and dig deep, similar to what we did again today, uh, to process the understanding and to look through the consumer guide, ask questions and get clarity. This helps them with why the under, understand why the need is there and why they're using the consumer guide and what's really important. And then for the ed report section, really provide an overview of the ed reports. Again, the background, the context, the review, provide the overview of the website tools and features and demonstrate how to use it live. It's very helpful for them to see the tools that's on the website, to click through that, to go deep dive into those reports, really identify the um, local priorities the vision at hand and what they're looking for as far as it comes to those reports. 
allow the time to let the participants to explore the website, um, allow them to ask questions. And then, of course, if there's any questions that you can't answer, you can always send them, you know, to edreports.com org we have our ops team that is available to answer any questions and then my side of the the organization the partnerships we're also here to help field any questions so participants are more than welcome to contact ed reports by the website with any questions that they might have and then for the closing and next steps we'll when you close that out make sure there's time for the day to debrief on what um they've learned for the day with reflections or discussions. You want people to leave your presentation, your training with getting enough information, sufficient information and have clear next steps. Then encourage the participants to continue to work through their learning with the consumer guide and the ed reports tools on their own. Give them that time to go on their own and work through that. And then if they have other questions, you can send them back to us or answer those. And then, of course, gather feedback on participation learning and experiences to inform future sessions, especially if you're going to be doing this in the future. Um, so with the next part is we're going to provide some work time um, and allow you to get into your co-op groups here in just a moment and work together. So the regional cooperative participants are going to be going into a breakout group and the EPP friends are going to stay here with us in the main room and we'll give you the next 20 to 25 minutes um, to customize your deck to really take your deck and make it your own for your in, in, make it your own for your district trainings and everything. The deck is in your participants folder and you can start customizing it and getting ready for when you go out in the field to present and train your districts and individuals on it. So that way you'll have a great nice start. We will also be available to go into your breakout room. So if you should have a question, you can use the ask for help feature that is in Zoom, or you can come back to the main room and then we can come into your groups. So the way this will work is I would recommend starting with the why materials matter section. And as you begin to work with your group on customizing your deck, if you have time, you can absolutely move on to other sections. If you think this deck has everything that you need and you don't feel like you need to change anything, you can move into steps two and three, which would be practicing, facilitating with each other, adding your speaker notes, practice with the talking points that's already there with the districts that are going to be receiving similar training. And so before we move in, I just want to stop here and see if there's any questions before we open up the rooms. practicing that nice wait time. <laughs> okay, seeing and hearing none. So what we're going to do is we'll open up the breakout rooms and we'll come back to the main room at around 1145. That will give you about 25 minutes to work within your breakout rooms. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to come, come back to the main room or use that ask for help feature in the Zoom and someone will come and join you. So I'm going to go ahead and open up those rooms. Oh, we've already got one in. I can see adding this to curriculum. Um, I can see adding this to curriculum courses to go over with candidates who will be choosing resources. Yeah. I think the uh, markers of high quality instructional resources are really important for us to uh, convey to our students and help them understand. Uh, when we place them in clinical experiences, um, the resources they have available uh, depends upon what the school district has chosen. But if they are aware of the markers, uh, I think that will go a long way with them understanding the importance of high quality instructional resources. Again, with those markers helping to lock in um, full standards alignment um, and then the inclusion of equity, absolutely. Yes. 
and Fox, someone from Lindsay Wilson posted in the chat. And, and I, I really appreciate that about they're already doing a lot of these things, but there might be some differences in vocabulary. So creating coherence across the vocabulary that we're using, both in K through 12 and in higher ed. Absolutely, because some of the differences are, are certainly inflected in the language. So any other ideas that see, that seems especially significant, or again, we've started shifting into thinking about potential implication, implications and what integration of these ideas might be like in prep programs or clinical experience. Yeah, just to add to that, I think, at least in my experience, something that we do really well is uh, sharing these ideas with pre-service teachers and helping them to be able to articulate those ideas of what good high quality instructional resources look like and what what they contain. But I think there's a, a little bit of a disconnect when we shift into practice. And so I think that's at least in my experience, that's where I need to be more supportive of my pre-service teachers uh, when we shift into practice, actually helping them to understand how to use those HQIRs mm -hmm. to create good lessons, to create good lesson plans, good units, uh, good assessment plans. Um, and then also now including uh, support for families as well. I think that's just super important. So thinking about really helping those the pedagogical pieces sort of transfer to use of an HQIR and then in inclusion of families also. And Johnny, I'll just give a little plug there. We're hoping to be able to help you all with that come fall because when we put out those protocols for unit and lesson internalization, being able to have our pre-service teacher utilize those protocols to internalize what's in an mm -hmm. HQIR and really do, I think the term that we're hearing now is intellectual prep. So instead of searching and curating and designing on their own, how do they intellectually prep with an HQIR? So please be on the lookout soon for those internalization protocols this fall that you all can use with your teachers. And they should slot right in there because mm -hmm. the pedagogical pieces you'll see that, that would go into just good design and facilitation anyway are present, but then it really helps explicitly transfer what that looks like within the context of, of utilizing a high quality resource. Sure. Yeah. And I think a big aha moment, at least for my students, is when we talk about lesson planning and we look at HQIRs and they see things like for example, one of the ones we looked at this this past semester had the, basically a, a, a set of I can statements written for every for every unit. And they were going, oh, wow, I, I don't have to recreate those wheels. And, and they're just so used to doing that um, because they need to learn to do that. But then, you know, it's just showing them, hey, there's a lot out there that that's really good. And it's and it's been designed by professionals and we could utilize those things. Um, I think they don't realize that. They think that somehow maybe that's cheating. And those are their words. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and so it's just kind of convincing them, hey, that, it, it's OK. It's OK to use those things. Certainly supplement them, but it's OK to use them. And, and there's still craft left when it comes to effectively leveraging them to enable learning. J just having them do doesn't do the entirety of it. There's still craft left in really using them effectively. Absolutely. And I want to just add on to that is, could you imagine you know, utilizing those resources, what impact it would have on teacher burnout. Like a lot of times the teacher burnout is related to all the extra hours, all the extra time is spent recreating the wheel when it's already there. Yep. Stephanie, to, to add on to that a little bit is um, our pre-service teachers, and I guess I'm jumping on to question two a little bit. We can uh, mode them into good behavior strategies about using good resources instead of falling into the Google searches and the Pinterest and all those, if we can show them and model them now how to get high quality instruction, mm -hmm. this is the time to do it. So that's some good implications that we can use mm -hmm. in the post-secondary. Yeah, practicing those best practices and then also have, helping them to understand why previous practices really are problematic when we think about results for students and equity especially. What about leaders? What are some of the implications potentially of this for leaders and, and what integration of these ideas might be like for leaders? And I don't know if any of our people on the call work with leaders in your programs. <laughs> so hopefully some of you, you do. Okay. Well, I don't know if this is exactly what you're <laughs> talking about. But one of this, um, an idea that came up in our workout room was that, you know, 
they, they look at HQIRs together. And then when they have their placements out into schools, you know, whatever practice that teacher engages in <laughs> to find. So I think that that's what makes um, kind of the approach we're taking today, like supporting cooperatives to support districts and schools, but also supporting pre-service teachers as they come up so that ultimately <laughs> we're working to get to get that to where teachers are using those HQIRs so that pre-service teachers see those HQIRs in use and model, um, similar to David said in their, in their courses, they're modeling that behavior based on their mentor teacher or whoever they're placed with through their student teaching and, and how powerful that shift might be. And Maggie, that to follow up with that, uh, and you're exactly right, hopefully they're placed with cooperating teachers are using this high quality. But if not, you know, what we've seen today is we can, you know, show our pre-service teachers, hey, this is how you can look and see, and here, here's how they done for you. you. We can look at what the resources are that your cooperative teachers are using. Is it high quality? And is and it would help them also when they're doing their own unit planning and things to go out and, and look for some high quality resources. <clears throat> so I, I think it's really great. It's, it's a win-win. And I would add to that, and, and now keep in mind, when they were talking about that HQIR dashboard a little bit earlier, and Fox, please correct me if I'm wrong, based on the 114 districts that reported what they were using, was it 85% 85. of the districts said they at least have an HQIR for math? Now, that didn't say anything about how they're effectively using it, you know, nothing like that. But we know at this point, just based on the self-reported data, 85% of our districts are saying that they do have, and there's a list on there of what's considered a math HQIR, that they do have those in their districts. At least one, yes. Yeah. But to so Misty's point, that doesn't least, really tell us about the effectiveness of implementation or the professional <laughs> learning around it or some of those parts we know that are really vital to having an HQIR realize its potential. That other things folks might be thinking. And Melissa, I think I know you're on here with us, so please feel free to jump in at any time. <laughs> Anything else anyone caught in, in the stream of the chat before we? And I know with EPPs, we're, we're still looking at literacy. We're still kind of putting stuff together for that. But, um, you know, I know that math has kind of been a part of our discussion, even this year, some things that we have a lot of EPP leaders that, that want to make sure that we're also evaluating math resources. So this comes at a good time to continue those discussions that we've had in our HQIR group. Thank you. And I think we would even throw out here, um, because we have just a couple of minutes, how can we support you all? Like, what are some things maybe that, that and I know we asked the question earlier, but since this is just the all EPP group here, what are some maybe additional things that you, you all could see that could support you in this work? Or quest questions from your side that you're wondering about that we might be able to pick up. Faye did ask a question in the chat. She said, are districts reporting HQIRs available based on district-wide or specific schools? Uh, Thomas Crystal, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's both. Like they do, I mean, I think they are going school by school, correct? That's what they're supposed to kind of inventory as. That is correct, Misty. Yeah. Any other challenges, needs, questions that you might have? Um, I, I, I would really like to see something, you know, a resource of maybe even classroom videos of teachers using high quality instructional resources in a high quality way, because I think sometimes that's the gap that I'm seeing with, with my pre-service teachers, their models have been, I do, we do, you do. <laughs> um, and that's how they think mathematics should be taught. And so then when I had them in practicum, a lot of times that's the model that they're seeing there as well. So being it, you know, um, it's hard to hunt down the teachers who are doing it right sometimes. 
uh, but having, you know, a model, a couple, you know, uh, elementary, middle and high, different grade level kinds of things of teachers um, in even in Kentucky, you know, who are who are doing these things well um, so that our, our we can use those in our classes and the, and the teachers can actually the kids, students can actually see. Um, OK, you know, so here's this high quality instructional material that we talked about. Um, but here's how it is used in the right way. You know, we could take it and we could use it in a bad way, but it, when it's done well, this is what it looks like. A lot of agreement with that showing up in the chat as well. Yeah, Katrina, I really like that idea as well. I think that's really that, you know, because one of the things that I've heard in our HQIR group and Katrina being someone who is uh a big part of that, I think that one of the things that we've seen is, yeah, some districts are not necessarily utilizing all of the resources and all of these things in the, um, you know, they're using them in different ways. So I agree if, if EPPs had access to videos that if their current district maybe doesn't have a strong example, they would still have access to it. So that's a great idea. And to be able to actually experience, you know, the, the the escalation of challenge and complexity, and then some of the scaffold, and then and, and some of the the incorporation of, of maybe some some problem based um, components, and then what does it look like to have a math a math classroom lean on collaboration and lean on discourse to help students arrive at, at some of those more challenging learning outcomes? To really being able to experience what that classroom was like beyond just sort of hearing about it or reading about it can be huge. And I, we can't promise that's something that would come soon. Um, you know, when we think about our math pilots, they're just going to be implementing next year. And so it, it takes a bit to, you all know, like when you're implementing a new resource like that, it's overwhelming in that first year because they're just trying to get to know the resource. So that is something we definitely have in mind for the future is being able to capture those. But in the short term, we can also um, lean into some of our partners that are in the cohort that we're a part of to see if they have some examples of videos. They just wouldn't be Kentucky specific. And that's the other thing we'd always want to make sure of is is what they're showing in alignment with our standards, because we also wouldn't right. want to confuse that messaging. <laughs> I can find bits and clips online, you know, back to the online searches <laughs> and I can find bits and clips of that here and there. But, yeah, a lot of times I have to clarify, OK, this is not Kentucky. This is. You know, <laughs> um, uh, but it would really be nice to just have a whole lesson and it doesn't have to be Kentucky, but like you said, aligned to our uh, a whole lesson that I could actually show kids where it was done well. And I think, Misty, um, one of the things that you've said in our conversations before is that this work is really pushing kind of at each of the levers in the system. And so even some of the resources um, I think Fox took us through the vendor questions <laughs> maybe earlier. And, and so as we continue to engage in this work and start asking these questions of vendors, I think we'll start to see um, kind of that push and that result on their end. And they may start providing some things like this as, as instructional supports through, through the work that they do. And so um, I think that it's, it's nice to have this really coherent vision of how we're shifting <laughs> and making progress from everybody who might play a role in the process. <laughs> I like that, Chuck. <laughs> any, other, any other final thoughts before we shift toward our exit ticket for today? Okay, well, before we get to that, thank you all so much for being with us today, for your time, for your dedication and commitment to the work and all that goes into that. We, it, we cannot express how appreciative we are on, on our end. Um, so before we do finish up today, we ask that you complete an exit ticket. Um, and the, the link to that form should be in the chat now. And of course, if you have any questions um, about completing that, feel free to reach out and ask, but we'll go ahead and we'll release you to complete the exit ticket. And then just thank you again for being with us today. And don't hesitate to reach out. Um, Please. Lisa, we are Please. always in conversations with her. So she can reach out to us with any questions or suggestions for like help that you all might need. Or ideas you might have, absolutely. <laughs> Gaps in things we're not seeing. Yes. <laughs>
And Stephanie, I think he, they will be coming back to us in just a minute. Sounds great. We'll wrap up. <laughs> Thank you all. We should have everybody back now, Stephanie. Thank you, Thomas. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for taking time to calibrate and collaborate with everyone and working your groups together. We had some great discussions here in the main room with the EPPs. I do hope you guys had some great discussions in your groups and was able to utilize that time on working on your, your deck and customizing it to fit your needs. Um, so I'm really looking forward to what you all do with all the information that we shared with you today. And the KDE team will be in touch with you with any additional steps that may be needed as you're planning and delivering trainings for your districts and your communities. So with that, um, the last thing we have for you today is the exit ticket. And if you wouldn't mind, take some time to provide some feedback um, on the day. That would be a great thing for for me to capture. Um, there is a space for if you have any additional questions or if you would like for someone from the Ed Reports team or the KDE team to reach out to you after this session, we'll follow up. So that is all from, from me today. Um, I want to thank you for your time, your energy, your engagement, your, your wonderful conversations, discussions. They have been really rich and really engaging. Um, and I'm so glad I've gotten a chance to interact with you all today and work on this project. And I will turn it back over to my KD friends for some last minute words. And I just wanted to say thank you uh, to everybody for being here. And then we did not introduce one of our team members um, who was in the meeting today, but I did want to take a, a minute to recognize Maggie Doyle. She's our secondary mathematics consultant. And so she was with us all day and you, some of you got to talk to her with, in the breakout room. So just wanted to uh, say thank you to Maggie for being here and thank you to everybody again for being here with us today. Yes, thank you all. We appreciate thank you. you. And Kimberly, to your question, I, I I don't think there's this there's no issue in sharing this slide. Deck. I mean, it's out there. So even yeah. if you share it with the district team, that's completely that's completely OK. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Go enjoy the beautiful day, yeah. like step outside for a little. It might be a little cool, but it's beautiful. Chris. out there. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you all. Yeah. <laughs>